Thank you, Ron and Tom, for leading us in worship this morning. Good morning, church. It's good to be with you all, as always. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open it to 1 John, the book of 1 John, chapter 4. We continue on with our series, Vital Signs. Um, you know, it's just a, it's really neat to see us together singing praises, uh, sitting and reading the, the Scriptures, sitting under the teaching of Scripture. As we continue this week, we're going to talk about love. And I, I know that sometimes we can have a skewed view of love, whether that's in terms of romance or pizza or the Kentucky Wildcats who are playing this afternoon. But how is love a vital sign in the life of a believer? And we've sort of touched on this a few weeks ago in 1 Corinthians 13, but we're going to delve into another aspect of love. Ultimately, where do we get the ability to love? And to love well. Who is that a reflection of? This morning, we're going to take a look at the words of John the Apostle to see what is love. So if you are able, please stand in honoring the reading of God's Word. We're going to pick up in verse 7 and go through the end of the chapter. John writes this. He says, Dear friends, let us love one another, because love is from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God because God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent His one and only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. Love consists in this. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we also must love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us, and His love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we remain in Him and He in us. He has given us His Spirit. And we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent His Son as the world's Savior. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in Him and He in God. And we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And the one who remains in love remains in God. And God remains in Him. In this, love is made complete with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as He is, so also we are in this world. There is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears is not complete in love. We love because He first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother or sister, he is a liar. For the person who does not love his brother or sister whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And we have this commandment from him, the one who loves God must also love his brother and sister. Let's pray. Father, as we submit ourselves to your word this morning, Lord, I pray that you would have your way with us, that, uh, Lord, by your spirit that we welcome into this place, that we give praise to, that we praise you in spirit and truth. Holy Spirit, may you open our minds and hearts to what you have for us that points to the truth of your love for us. And we thank you for Jesus. So, Father, have your way. Spirit, speak through your word and your servant. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. Many years ago, once in a bout of doubting the assurance of my own salvation, uh, in that wrestling, I was told to go read the book of First John, and I would know by the time I got to the end whether I was a Christian or not. 
This is a great letter in general to read, to check many vital signs, some which we have already talked about in the Christian life. When we think about the letter of 1 John, it was written by the account of most scholars, John the Apostle, or as he's referred to in the book of John, the one whom Jesus loved, which is how he referred to himself. And most scholars believe that he was writing from Ephesus. Uh, it's, uh, most early church historians and early church traditions say that John actually left Jerusalem just a handful of years before the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD. This exit to Ephesus from Jerusalem could have come under the reign and the persecution of the Roman emperor Nero. But why is John writing a letter when he's already written a massive gospel? You think, man, 21 chapters, it's a gospel. Like, that's a lot of content, John thinks. Why is he choosing to write a letter? You see, there were some in the church at Ephesus who had left the church because they no longer acknowledged Jesus as the Son of God and the way to salvation. Most of those who left the church at the time fell prey to Gnosticism, which is the belief that salvation only comes through knowledge. Somewhat of a secret knowledge. So instead of responding to the Gnostics, John actually is writing and encouraging those believers who are remaining faithful. Remaining faithful in the truth of what Jesus taught. He implores them to remain faithful and obedient in what Jesus taught. And he reminds them that through Jesus, we have a relationship with God, which brings about a great reward. One of the ways that John shows his readers that believers are in a healthy place spiritually is how they love. The first thing I want us to see this morning is God's love is perfect, and it's a picture of how much He values us. God's love is perfect, and it's a picture of how much He values us. If you think about it, God's love for you is evident just in Jesus. I mean, there's more ways that we know that God loves us, but just think about Jesus. Look at, look at verse 9. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent His one and only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. This points to the gospel message. This is almost, this is almost like, hey, by the way, if you forgot when you read the gospel that I sent a few years ago, that God so loved the world that He sent His Son. It's almost like, just in case you forgot, I'm going to rehash this for you guys. For God so loved the world that He sent His one and only Son. Whoever would believe in Him won't perish but have everlasting life. And Jesus Himself in His life and ministry had a sacrificial love, a self-sacrificial love for us to die on the cross. And He showed the love of God. He, he is our example of how to love ultimately. And he also showed the love of God because he was God. Think about what Paul writes in Romans 5. He says, For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a just person. Rarely will someone die for a just person. Though for a good person, someone might even perhaps dare to die. But God proves His own love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How much more then, since we have now been justified by His blood, will we be saved through Him from wrath? For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, then how much more, having been reconciled, we will be saved by His life? And not only that, we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received this reconciliation. If you just think about this passage, like 
that God sent his son. And we talk about this every week. It's, it's a core piece of the gospel message. But if you think about it in terms of God's love, God shows you how valuable you are to him. And what lengths he has gone to rescue you. Do some of us sometimes struggle realizing how valuable we are? How much God values us? We are made in His image, but we aren't just made in His image. But it says we are the pride of His creation. You are the object of His desire and love. So church, do you know, sometimes even myself, do we know how valuable we are to God. God shows how much He loves and values you. That He not only wants to rescue you, but He wants for you to experience true life. You think about Jesus' words, I have come that they may have life and have it, what? Sort of. Oh, sorry, abundantly. Through Jesus' Sacrifice, we not only have forgiveness of sin, eternal life, and a restored relationship with God, but we have more. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us in this life. Logic, you know, like it would make sense if the Holy Spirit lived inside of us in eternity, because you'd be like, well, of course, you know, we're in God's presence, blah, 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 blah. But no, like right now, like, when we turn on the news and we think about how bad the world is, like, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us right now. He walks through this life with us for us to experience it with Him. This is why John says, if you truly love the way God does, you know God. But if you don't love or if you love in a human fleshly love, you don't know God because why? He is the epitome of love. If you don't know that, then it's sort of like if you don't know gravity, well, sorry. You know, like it's one of those things like God is love. What does experiencing God's love truly feel like? What is it? Like to not only be reconciled, but to be adopted with all the rights and privileges that come with that. What is it like to be valued like that? Have you truly experienced that love? Understanding how valuable, how valuable you are, and also that God, like, not just saves you and reconciles you, puts His Spirit inside of you, but that He wants you to experience abundant life right now. The best that He has to offer. It makes me think of, you know, when we adopted Gracie, we, we went to the orphanage in Vietnam and we picked her up. And you know, like, once you sign, the paper, you know, once you sign on the dotted line, and all the paperwork's official, Right? But what would it have been like if we'd have been like, hey, we rescued you, we saved you, all right, you're going to come home with us, and like, life doesn't change that much. She, she would have, you know, what if she'd gotten the, like the same food and the same clothes, and we only took her to the doctor when she was like really, 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 sick. you know, like, but no, like, that's not, that's not how adoption works, Right? That, we, that a child is not only rescued out of being an orphan, but to have the fullest life possible. Whether that's doctor's visits, therapies, but also events. Also experiences. We took the girls a few weeks ago to Great Wolf Lodge, and that kid went crazy in there. Would she have been able to experience that one, if she had not been brought out of the orphanage, but two, that the ones who loved her wanted her to have an abundant life. It's the same way when God loves us, that He shows us that G He sent His Son, like that's already testament enough. 
He sent His Son to take your place and my place. But not just to rescue us, but for us to experience life. For us to experience what life is really like. What it's supposed to be. The second thing I want us to see this morning is God's love in us is an assurance of salvation. Hold on. It's an, it's an assurance of salvation. It's not the assurance of salvation, right? Like, oh man, I'm loving my people well. All right, I'm good to go. Like, no, it's, it's a fruit. It's, it's an assurance of salvation. God's love should be evident in us if we follow Jesus. John says that no one has ever seen God. But if you know Him and are in a relationship with Him, your love shows that God is abiding in you. So we should love each other sacrificially. We should love each other patiently. We should love each other honestly. And love doesn't mean that you have to be perfect. But it does mean that you should treat people the right way. But His love still changes us. Every believer has the Holy Spirit living inside them, residing in their heart. And His presence, therefore, is always with us. But that should show that not only God is abiding in us, but that we, in turn, are abiding in Him. Look at verse 13. He says, this is how we know that we remain in Him and He in us. He has given us His Spirit. You know, it's, it's not just, hey, this is a benefit of salvation. God's putting His Spirit inside of me. Yes, absolutely. But there's more. Is that we now have the opportunity to abide in Him. To live life in Him. To live life His way. As He is our Lord and King. The abiding relationship with God is our true assurance. It is not the, the things we do or the things we don't do. It is if we know Jesus and have a relationship with Him. What we do reflects whether this is the case or not. You see, John the Apostle, the one who's writing this, personally knew Jesus. And he gives the verification marker that if you really know Jesus, then you really know God's love and He abides in you. And if He abides in you, as they say, the proof will be in the pudding of your life. If you know God and abide in Him, He is also perfecting you, molding you more into the image of Jesus. And He is doing this by His love. And that love is becoming more and more present in our lives. And because of His love, Jesus has been judged in our place. And you and I, therefore, as John says, shouldn't be afraid of judgment. And because we don't have to be afraid of judgment, we can live with confidence, not in ourselves, but in God. Because His Spirit, He gives us His Spirit. He gives us His love. He gives us His life. So we, we can't boast about anything. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it is... From Him that you are in Christ Jesus, who became wisdom, of, wisdom from God for us, our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. If you think about the Holy Spirit abiding in us, and the fruit that bears out of that in love, Abiding in God's love. You know, this Friday we celebrated St. Patrick's Day. 
I don't know how many of you all know the history of St. Patrick. It's the more I dive into it every year for a couple days surrounding the day, I get more enthralled by the story. Because, you know, growing up, you know, it's chasing leprechauns and snakes into the ocean with a flute or what, you know, like that's what they tell you, you know, so you got to find the end of a rainbow and there's lucky charms there. You know, it all kind of runs together. But the actual story of St. Patrick is that he grew up in a wealthy English family and he was kidnapped by pirates and sold into slavery in Ireland. And he was the slave of a shepherd for, I think, six years or so. And he was often left alone in the fields watching these sheep. And his parents were Christians and he was sort of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was during that time that Patrick met God, and he would pray for hours and hours. He would commune with God. He would abide in God, and God would abide in him for years until he escaped and went back to England. He gets back to England. He's reunited with his family. You know, it's like hugging it out, almost like a dramatic movie, and you think that's the end. But no, that's the beginning of the story. You see, because of God's love showing itself in his life and his love, Patrick feels the call to go as a missionary back to the people who had kidnapped him and held him as a slave. I don't know any other love that would do that other than the love of God. He said, these people need to hear about Jesus. And his, his parents, his family are like, no, don't do that. But he says, God's called me, and he's put the love of himself in me for these people, and they need to hear about Jesus. And so that is where the origin of St. Patrick's Day came from. That the Irish people could hear the gospel for the first time. So does God's love abide in you? Does He abide in you? Do you abide in Him? Last thing, our love for each other should be a reflection of God's love towards us. Our love for each other should be a reflection of God's love towards us. Look at verse 19. And we're going to read it backwards. Because He first loved us, we love. Because He first loved us, now we love. We should love out of a position that God has loved us. We should love out of a place that we have value. We, we covered that earlier. That we are valuable, but the other person that we are loving has as much value as we do because God has told us so and that Jesus has proved it on the cross. We are called to love each other within the body of Christ, the church, because God has loved each one of us. We should value the things God values. And John tells us that If we say that we love God, but not one of His people, that we are liars. Let that sink in. If we say that we love God, but not His people, or a certain segment of His people, it says that we are liars. I don't like to be called a liar. That's strong words. Fred D. Howard in his commentary writes, it is impossible not to love a visible brother and at the same time love the invisible God. The love commandment includes both the vertical love for God and the horizontal relationship, love for man. I could even add a line to the banners behind us. I'm not going to do that because that would require a ladder and a sharpie. But 
The, the line that I would add is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, including those within the body of Christ. We love each other by allowing ourselves to be held accountable with each other. We keep eternity in mind as we interact with each other. Believe it or not, you may bump into some, we may bump into each other in eternity. You know, we, we must keep eternity in mind as we interact with each other. Sometimes bearing with each other patiently. We invest in the growth of others around us and behind us, or behind us, however you want to look at it. My hope is that you and I in this room today leave a legacy of love here in this church long after we're gone, that that's what we're remembered for. Think about how we long to reach and disciple young families in our community. One practical way is by loving their kids. The next generation investing in those behind us. Loving them as God has loved us. Right now, you could invest in the generation behind you by loving on them or loving on their kids. And we are in need of volunteers in the children's ministry. Maybe God's calling you today not to come forward and pray, not to, to join our church, not to even know Him. For some of you in this room, maybe God is calling you to step out in faith and in love to serve the next generation. What a picture of real practical love. If you think about real practical love and how you know we reflect God's love to each other when we are loving well. I don't know how many of y'all heard growing up. I did. That look, you look just like your dad. That's just like your dad. Or that's just like, you know. How many of y'all have been told that at some point you look just like a parent or acted just like a parent? Some of you, some of you don't want to acknowledge that. It's okay. We can talk about it afterwards. But you know, a kid that looks just like their parents, they're the mannerisms, the phrases used, the actions, the temperament. They are a reflection of their parents. So if we are to love like our Heavenly Father, should we not reflect Him and His love? So that we can be just like our Dad. Jesus in John 13, he says, I give you a new command. Love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So is God's love in you? You can love someone, but do you love them the way that God loves them? If you claim to follow Jesus... That love should be in you and God should be cultivating that. Maybe you're here this morning and you need to repent of the way you've treated somebody because it wasn't loving. Maybe you just need to find the rest that you're looking for by not working yourself to death. Instead of trying to earn God's love, realizing how already valuable you are. And that Jesus paid the price for your sins. That you, by putting faith in Him, that that's done. That you need to rest in God's love. Maybe sit and abide with Him. From that abiding in Him, a love will overflow in your life like no other. And this may just lead you to serve others. Just like Jesus' love led him to wash his disciples' feet. Also in John 13, 
Jesus said, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are speaking rightly, since that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done for you. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never experienced God's perfect love for you in Jesus. If you don't know Him, then you have no assurance. You have every reason to fear judgment. But the good news is that He extends His love and grace to you. Maybe this morning you need to abide in Him for the first time. If you repent, that's turn and walk away from the sin in your life. Believe the gospel, the good news of Jesus, His life, death, and resurrection. That it applies to you. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead. You will be saved. Those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. So today is the day of salvation. That opportunity is before you. Will you accept His love for you? How amazing would it be to see us as Finchville Baptist Church abide in God and experience His love His assurance, and His rest. You see, folks, we we don't know love until we've been loved by God. And what Scripture teaches, He has loved us to the maximum by giving us His Son, by giving us new life. And the call for us is to look just like our Heavenly Father, to go and love like He loves. And the only way that that happens is by His Spirit abiding in us. And folks, it'll just overflow. It'll be like a pipe that won't turn off. You're going to be hunting for spiritual buckets everywhere to put it everywhere. And that's how we're called to love as we live. Let's pray. Father, as we come to You, we want to acknowledge first Your love for us. We don't know love. We can't understand true love unless we look at how You have loved us. And Your Word says that You sent Your Son from heaven to earth to live as one of us, to live with us to die in our place, to take on Your wrath on our sin. That we are the reason He was there. And Lord, not only do You save us, the Lord, that You give us everlasting and abundant life right now. And that You give us Your Spirit. What a picture of love something that none of us in this room deserve. Lord, we acknowledge that this morning. Lord, maybe some of us in this room need to go to somebody and say, I have not loved you well. Will you forgive me? Some of us may need to just sit and rest in what you have done for us and knowing how valuable we are to you and just sit and abide in you. Lord, You are good. Your love is amazing. Help us to love by Your Spirit, by Your power, by Your strength. Help us to love the way You love. Not just the the lost world outside of these walls, but even the people inside of these walls. Help us to love like You do. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.